Hello and welcome to video Waves 1B about wave phenomenon. There are five different phenomena that we really need to think about when you're observing something that you think is a wave. Reflection, transmission, interference, refraction, and diffraction. Let's talk about a wave pulse first. Let's say that we have a string attached to a pole and we are going to send a pulse down it. So in this particular case, we have a wave that is, a wave pulse that is formed on the left side, and as the energy moves across, the particles in the string, remember, are moving up and down. But then when we get over here, because the string is loosely connected, we have what we call a soft boundary. The string goes up, as the energy indicates it should, and the wave just keeps traveling back and forth over the top part of the string. Now, if we make an adjustment so that the connection is not a soft boundary, but instead it is a hard boundary, you're gonna notice that there's gonna be a bit of a change in what happens. We now have a hard boundary here on the right, and the wave direction initially is still to the left, although it does come back again Sorry, still to the right, although it does come back again to the left. In this case, we have the energy causing the particles to go up and down, but when it gets here to the connection point, the string is pushing the knot up. So Newton's laws say that the knot must be pushing the string down, which is why in this case, the wave pulse hits the edge and reflects back on the bottom, unlike previously where it reflected back on the top. So it flips its side here. This that we've seen here is in fact the first property of a wave. It is called reflection. Reflection is essentially the bouncing of a wave off of a boundary. So now let's look at this reflection in terms of a static picture of a wave right as it hits the boundary. We have this thing called the law of reflection. And the law of reflection essentially says that the incident ray coming in on the left here, shown in red, we have a whole wave front coming. A wave front is basically rather than just saying we have one ray coming in, we've got lots and lots and lots of rays coming in, but we're only interested in this one red ray because we are focused on this center point. It is at an angle of theta i from the normal. This is what the law of reflection says, that theta i is equal to theta r. If you can draw a normal to your surface, to the point where your ray is reflecting, then the angle of incidence will be equal to the angle of reflection. And you have to make sure that you measure the angles from the normal, not from the surface, because if it's not flat, it's gonna get goofy. The next phenomenon we're gonna look at that all waves do is called transmission. This is when we talk about waves going through boundaries. Depending on the medium that the wave is traveling in and the media that the wave is going between will determine how it behaves it goes through the boundary between the media. For example, the rope on the left goes from a rope of low density to a rope of higher density. The rope of lower density has the ability to allow the wave to travel at a higher speed. Then when we get to the boundary between the two ropes here and the density changes, that higher speed, that energy suddenly slows down. As we can see, it's the wave is going slower in the thicker part of the rope. But you'll also notice that a little bit of the energy is being reflected backwards. This is because since it is a higher density and it's going to take more energy to um, move the rope, it's almost like hitting the corner of a brick wall. Some of the energy just gets bounced back through the thinner rope because it's easier to do that. And the rest of it goes through the thicker, higher density rope. On the right hand side, you'll notice that the opposite is happening. We start out with the energy in a higher density rope, so it's going at a slower speed, and you'll notice that it's actually a little bit of a lower amplitude as well. And then it reaches our boundary where it is less dense, 
and it can suddenly go faster as well as have a higher amplitude because the same amount of energy would be able to move the rope particles on the right a far farther distance than on the left. And also notice that just like in the um, animation on the left, here on the right, the wave is also being reflected. However, notice that the reflected wave on the right stays on the top of the rope, unlike on the left where it goes back, it goes on the bottom. Similar to what we saw before with a loose end versus a fixed end um, boundary on the last slide, this is what the wave is interpreting this distinction between media as. Um, a loose end and a fixed end. So when we're talking about transmission, waves can go through boundaries, but some of their properties can change. Oftentimes their speeds change, which again will oftentimes result in a change of wavelength. The frequency, however, will not change. The frequency is a characteristic of the wave that is a constant. So the second characteristic, the second phenomenon that we're looking at here then is transmission. Things reflect, things transmit. A third phenomenon that we need to look at is interference. There are three types of interference, constructive, destructive, and superpositioning. If we look at this uh, animation here, it looks as though we have a top wave that's not moving, a left wave that's moving to the right, and a bottom wave that just seems to be sitting there but moving up and down within its space. If we think about it as the top wave moving to the left and the bottom wave moving to the, sorry, the middle, middle wave moving to the left, you can see that when their crests line up, the bottom wave, which is an addition of them, is a maximum. And then when you have a crest and a trough, it's at a minimum. Okay, so we have a maximum, and then we have a crest and trough now, and we have a minimum. The superposition principle says that when two waves pass through the same point, the displacement is the arithmetic sum of the individual displacements. So if, they, if the waves are lined up, they are said to be in phase, then their displacement will be larger. This is constructive interference. If the waves are completely opposite of each other or 180 degrees out of phase, then their displacements will cancel each other out. This is destructive interference. If it is not either of these two extreme situations, it is out of phase of some amount, but not 180 degrees out of phase and not completely in phase, then we say that the waves are superimposed and the results are usually somewhere between the nothing and the maximums. This can occur in any media. So let's take a look at this without all of this moving to see what it really looks like. All right, so now here in picture A, we have a situation where we have constructive interference. Wave A and wave B are right in line with each other. The peaks line up or the crests line up, the troughs line up, the nodes line up. When they all line up, the result is doubling of the amplitude or an addition, if they're not the same amplitude to begin with, a maximum addition of the amplitudes. Total destructive interference occurs when a crest and a trough line up with each other. When the crest and trough line up with each other, the positive displacement of the crest adds to the negative displacement of the trough and you end up with nothing. The waves have canceled each other out. It doesn't mean that the energy is gone. The energy is still there. Now, you could also have a situation like this last one where it's not total constructive interference. It's not total destructive interference. Instead, we simply have superpositioning going on, where if we take a look, you can see that the crests and the troughs don't really line up. So they superposition. And again, the displacements of each of the particles in the top wave are added to the displacements of the bottom wave. And we end up with something in between, which we end up with C for the superpositioned wave. 
understanding how to get superpositioning and interference results is going to be super important when we get to both um, looking at light in more detail and when we get to sound because it affects sound um, in ways that I'm sure you're familiar with if you've ever gone to a movie theater or um, a concert hall and sat in some place where the sound just wasn't very good. But we'll come back to that later. The next phenomenon is called diffraction. This is when waves encounter an obstacle, they bend around it, leaving a shadow region. So if you look at this top picture here, coming in, you have wave fronts coming in, and they're gonna hit these bars, but there's a hole in the bars, there's a space, so the wave energy from right here can get through. And as it gets through, it bends around the corner. This is how we can hear around corners because sound waves bend around corners. They diffract around corners. This is how you can see that there's light on in a window or out in a door as it comes out through the, the light comes out through the door and it bends around. Some of it goes straight through, but then at the edges, as I say, it diffracts. Now you can see here we have a little bit of a different situation. We have a wave fronts coming in but now rather than going through a hole there's something in the way and for that something that's in the way the waves right next to it continue to travel straight but then when they get to the corner they bend a little bit and these ones bend a little bit until eventually they recombine here a little bit behind the wave front that they created so you end up with this shadow region here and a little bit of a shadow region here and over here. Now the amount of diffraction is going to be dependent on the size of the obstacle compared to the wavelength. So if the obstacle is much smaller than the wavelength, the wave is barely affected, like here in A. There's a little bit of a space, but then the wave comes right back. If the object is comparable to or comparable to the wavelength, the diffraction is much more significant. So whereas with the just the blades of grass, it was just one little wave front that was missing. Now you put a stick in the water and there's a couple of them. If you continue and you have a short wavelength coming up and it passes a log, then there's going to be this big area of shadow behind it. So the diffraction is much more significant because at this point, the object or the obstacle is close to or greater than the wavelength. And then on D, you have long wavelength waves passing a long log, and you're gonna notice that there's, again, this space behind it, not quite as much as with the short wavelength, but there is still a shadow region behind it. So diffraction occurs when there is an obstacle that the wave need the wave energy can get around and how much it bends as it goes around is determined by the relationship between the size of the obstacle and the wavelength of the wave. The last characteristics that waves show is called refraction. This is what happens when waves travel between different media. For example, when light travels from outer space into the atmosphere, at the boundary between space and the atmosphere, the light bends slightly, which accounts for colors and sunrises and sunsets and all that sort of stuff. If you want to think of another one, when light goes from the air into water, it also bends again as it goes through that boundary because the densities are different. We saw this with transmission, but now something else happens to them and that something else that happens is called refraction. So let's think about the situation that I have shown here. We have rows of soldiers who are out marching somewhere. And as soldiers are, they're very precise. They're all nicely, neatly lined up. They're all marching at the same speed, same distance apart in exactly the same direction. But then the guy on the far left here ends up getting into some mud. He would like to keep up with the rest of his group but he cannot because the frequency with which he travels has to remain the same. So his speed changes, his angle of di his direction changes because he should be going this way and he's not anymore because 
it is so difficult to move in the mud compared to the firm ground. Now his neighbor, again, should be going this way. His path changes direction. Then pretty soon the next one again changes direction, etc., etc., until they all get to the point where they're all in a harder medium to travel through. So they have all changed their direction and changed their wavelength and as a result changed their speed. If we let each soldier represent a particle in a wave front, then we can see how this is what would happen to a wave of say light or sound as it encounters a medium that is harder to get through than the current medium it is traveling. Similarly, the bend would occur the other way if the wave were going from the muddier medium into a firmer medium. So let's take a look at this not now with rows of soldiers, but now let's take a look at, look at it with a ray of light. We still have our soldiers on the left there, but now on the right, let's look at it in terms of light rays. We have a light ray coming in in red. It is making some angle theta one with the normal between our first surface or our first medium and our second medium. We can probably assume based on the way that these are drawn that this is air and this is water. When the light reaches the boundary between the air and the water, it will bend, it will refract, such that the angle here, theta 2, is less than theta 1. And the wavelength is less than the wavelength had been in air. So this refraction is the bending of light as it goes between media. And the light could go from the air into the water, or we could reverse it and have the light go from the water into the air. And this, the opposite things would happen. So your theta one would be in the water, your theta two would be in the air, theta two would now be greater than theta one. But again, remember it all has to do which substance is harder for the wave to get through. We'll determine whether the wave is gonna to bend towards or away from the normal. Let's take a, another look at this. The bending or changing of angles, speeds, and wavelengths can be explained with a law called Snell's Law. Snell's law says that there is a distinct relationship between the incident angle and the refracted angle, and it is based on what your two media are. Snell's law, when written out, is N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. N1 and N2 are characteristic properties of the medium, and it is called the index of refraction. It is a ratio of how fast light can travel in the medium compared to how fast it can travel um, in a vacuum. They are characteristic properties of the media that we are talking about here. For example, the index of refraction of air we say is 1.00 because light can essentially travel the speed of light in air as it can in, in space. The difference is small enough that we can ignore it. However, when we move light to travel into water, it's significantly more difficult for light to travel in water than it is in air. So its index of refraction is 1.33. In glass, it's even more difficult. The index of refraction there is about 1.5, depending on the type of glass that we have. The index of refraction values are listed in your book, um, or they could be what it is you're looking for within the problem itself. So refraction in Snell's law is something that we can use to figure out where the light's going to be after it goes into a new medium and or reverse, we can figure out where an object really is down in the water, for example. Refraction is also why when you do something like put a pencil or a straw in a glass of water, it looks like it is broken as it does here. And this is because, again, your eyeball is up here you're looking down at the glass, and the actual straw, of course, is a straight line, we all know that, but because you're looking at the bottom of the straw, 
the light is going to come straight up from the bottom of the straw and then it's going to bend towards your eye. Your brain doesn't understand that there's a bend occurring at the surface. So your brain's going to think the bottom of the straw is over here. So it's going to see it further to the left than it really is. Similarly, this is what happens if you go fishing and you look down into the lake or into the river and you go, oh, there's a fish and you cast your rod. Your line's going to go down and you want your line not to go where it looks like the fish is, but to where the fish actually is. So you have to keep in mind that refraction has occurred and figure out where the fish really is relative to where you're looking based on the amount of difference between the indices of refraction. Now, what if you were the fish? Could you see the fisherman that's trying to catch you for dinner? Let's think about this for a minute. It may sound a little bit crazy to you. Maybe the fish can see you. Maybe the fish can't see you. Let's see. Here's our water. Okay, here's the land. We got our fisherman with a wiggly worm on the hook. Now we have our fish. We've got two fish down here. They're both looking at that wiggly worm. The question is, can the fish see the fisherman or not? Well, this fish on the left probably can't because they're looking in the opposite direction. But this fish on the right, I don't know. Let's see. The fish is looking at the wiggly worm, but then he's also looking up at the surface. According to what we just said, Snell's Law, when we go from something that is less dense to something that is more dense, the object, the light was bending towards the normal. So when we go the opposite, it should bend away from the normal. So this is a pretty big angle there, but let's say that it bends more. Oh, definitely, so this is theta one, this is theta two. So this fish can see the fisherman's foot. Probably not so sure what that is. What if we have another fish, this old fish here, is going to take a look up. And then again, here's the angle of incidence. The angle of refraction is going to be greater. So this fish sees the person. It's like, I ain't touching that worm. I don't want to get caught. I want to keep living. Now, this other fish is like, I don't think it's a person. I think it's just something else. I'm going to go for it. The question becomes, what's the difference between what the fish are seeing? Well, it all comes down to the initial angle, the theta of incidence, theta 1. And the smaller theta 1 is, the smaller theta 2 is. But your angle is still going to increase. You can see, I think, that if we had another fish that was, say, up here and was looking at the surface, this is a huge angle of incidence and their angle of refraction may be such that they can't see the fisherman because their angle of refraction is right across the top of the water in which case it looks just like water it doesn't look like anything else so since light will be going from a denser medium into the less dense medium it will speed up it will bend away from the normal and at some point in the angle, depending on where the fish is, the light is going to be bending so far away from the normal that it could end up bending right back into the water. If we take a look here at this picture, it does a better job of explaining it than my fish picture does. Let's say in this case we have a source of light underwater, say a flashlight. The light that goes straight up from that will will cross the boundary and continue to go straight up. Then as you increase your angle of incidence, your angle of refraction increases. But when you get to the angle of 41 degrees, you hit what is called the critical angle. And at the critical angle, the light no longer escapes into the air. It starts to be refracted across the surface of the water. Then any angle that's larger than 41 degrees is now going to be reflected back into, sorry, this is glass, reflected back into glass, and we have what's called total internal reflection. So what starts out as refraction, the light going through the surface into a new medium, becomes total internal reflection if theta 1, it gets too big. When we are going from an object or a substance rather that has a larger n into a substance that has a smaller n. So we get a critical angle and then we get total internal reflection. 
All right, so let's recap. If you are observing a wave, you should be able to observe all five of these characteristics given the proper situation. You will need to be able to explain the wave phenomena by both solving problems about them as well as verbally explaining them. So remember, reflection is bouncing off of a surface or off of a boundary. Transmission is the wave being able to go from one medium into another medium. It can be transmitted through another medium. When that occurs, there's typically changes in speed. You also have superpositioning when more than one wave is trying to exist in the same space. Then the waves interfere with each other, either constructively or destructively, or a combination of the two where you have superpositioning. We can also have diffraction occurring where there's an obstacle in the wave's path and it has to bend around or through the obstacle. And finally, we have refraction where light bends and changes its angle when it goes from one medium to another based on the density of the mediums as well as based on the characteristic properties of that medium about whether it's difficult or easy for the wave energy to get through. With this, along with the sample calculations you had in the last video, um, you now know all of the basics about waves.